Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence webinar, Creating a Culture of Excellence, Operationalized Culture by Focusing on Process. Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our great sponsors and a special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldridge Society, who serve as the trustees of the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence, and our newest members, Mid-America Transplant and the Center for Organ Recovery and Education. Here's today's agenda. Our special guest today is Mr. Paul Worstel, retired president, ProTech Coding Company, a national Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award recipient organization. Before I turn it over to Paul, I just wanna remind everybody that his talk today on creating a culture of excellence is very timely. When you look throughout the entire Baldrige criteria and the focus on workforce engagement, and creating a culture that can deal with all of the contemporary challenges that we see today with the great resignation, with recruiting and retaining talent and developing that talent to meet the mission and vision of the organization. We could not have a better master at this than Mr. Paul Worstel. So Paul, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks Al for that very kind introduction. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure. Uh, for me to spend a little time with you this afternoon. Um, it's been a while since I've been around my Baldrige friends and uh, while this is virtual, um, I feel like I'm in the presence of, uh, of, of Baldrige friends and I'm, uh, I'm enjoying that very much. Well, so why don't we get started? Um, the, let me give you a little background on the presentation. Uh, this is, uh, an old presentation that's been dusted off and updated a little bit, um, but it goes back to probably 2015. And uh, I was with a group of folks and we talked frequently about culture and Baldridge and the fact that Baldridge is all systematic approach, process, 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 process. And we think about culture as oftentimes being something uh, rather uh, subjective. And I was making a case that no, um, we could build process around culture and, um, and deploy it and uh, create or transform uh, culture. So um, that's what we're gonna take a look at today. It worked, I have control and it worked. So um, for me, a very simple uh, definition of culture is well, first of all, every organization has a culture. That's not to say that they are all good cultures, but every organization does have a culture. As Stephen Covey says in uh, principle-centered leadership, um, yeah, even street gangs have a culture. And those cultures are defined by your values. Your values are defined by your organizational behaviors. So my goal in a presentation is to present culture of excellence uh, as process through examples, um, really personal examples. And while um, I'm presenting and talking about these concepts, it will, I will present them as if they are principles, like they are absolutes. Well, of course they're not. They just happen to be strongly held beliefs that have formed over time for me. Um, much of the learning has been uh, through the Baldridge community, serving as an examiner, um, being an applicant, attending many, many Baldridge conferences, and having the opportunity to learn from and benchmark great organizations. So I'd like to cover five themes today, um, clarity of purpose, over communication, trust through leadership, clear expectations of behavior, and a clear line of sight. Um, and again, much of what I'll be sharing with you today or learnings that I've experienced reading, you'll see a fair amount of Stephen Covey and Patrick Lencioni and Jim Collins in the presentation. And um, there may be organizations here that will say, oh, I recognize that. That was in a presentation that I made at a Baldridge conference. Uh, I claim no pride in ownership here. 
uh, rarely do I have an original thought. So um, I wish there had been a way that I could have uh, sent the, this culture map to you. I borrowed this actually from uh, an organization that I spent quite a bit of time with in Pittsburgh uh, and in an effort to map their processes and keep it simple, they created this idea of a five by five culture map. So I borrowed the five by five culture map to be able to put the three topics uh, or the three, the five themes that I wanna cover at the top to be able to segment the presentation. This will be provided um, when uh, Al and Jerry share the presentation after today. So first, clarity of purpose. Um, leadership teams have the responsibility to renew, deploy mission values and vision annually, um, sharing your mission vision values with passion and clarity. I think we all know that uh, mission is our purpose. Why do we exist? And a well-crafted mission statement um, with organizations who use them and use them frequently understand the value in having a well-crafted mission statement. Vision, vision or values, enduring beliefs that describe what is important to your organization. We'll keep going. And vision, a clear concrete picture of what the organization will look like in the future, uh, in a future pursuit of its mission. Um, this was Henry Ford's vision. Uh, this app actually was an article in the Saturday evening post uh, in the 20s and created uh, a, a vision that really did create uh, a very, very clear, uh, great aspirational goal for Ford Motor Company, opening the highways to all mankind. So what do we do with it when we have well-crafted uh, mission, vision, and values statements that have had input from the organization and there is buy-in. Um, there's many, many things that I would recommend and, um, and we see it in best practices in many uh, high-performing organizations to play, displaying mission and values uh, throughout your uh, facility. And uh, rather than creating a sign that you hang on a wall, find a way to make it look more permanent. Um, symbolically, it says these are lasting. Um, it's not a flavor of the day. It's not a poster or a sign that will be taken down and replaced with something else tomorrow. Include mission on um, business cards, letterhead, emails, signatures, um, every opportunity you have to, uh, to display your mission and, and values, uh, take advantage of it. Um, it's the, uh, the, the business cards is an example that I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, at Protect Coding Company, um, we issue business cards to every employee. They got a box of business cards during their orientation. And this was everyone from a senior leader uh, to the most recently hired entry level position, a, um, a warehouse specialist. And it was the best $20 per employee we ever spent. Clarity of purpose and include uh, your mission statements, your vision statements on letterhead, on your website, every place you can think of. talk a little bit more about mission and values before we move to over communicating purpose. Um, there are opportunities also uh, to, to share your mission statement. Um, when, uh, you're making, when you're making an announcement, when you're sharing good news, when you are in a position where you have to uh, share something that's gonna be unpopular with the workforce. Rather than saying, oh, Paul got up this morning on the wrong side of bed or bumped his head and came up with this crazy idea, 
No, no, if you can tie it back to your core beliefs always, uh, it can be very, very effective in helping align the organization around decisions that have to be made, aligning them with core beliefs. Um, over communicating purpose. This happens to be a communication matrix that we created at Protec. Um, a little bit too much process for some maybe, but it worked for us. Um, and, and we're not gonna cover all of it, but you get the idea. Um, the communication event, the sender, the receiver, uh, the forum, how frequently these were just types of communication that we had uh, so that we could identify um, what was most effective. What's the message? Uh, what is the delivery method? Is there two-way communication and how do we verify it? Again, each time there is change uh, to be introduced into your organization, link it with your core beliefs and search for opportunities to do that. Um, I think there are examples of many great leaders out there who uh, have become very, very skilled at aligning their core beliefs with communication to all of their stakeholders. This happens to be one of them. This is uh, Dr. Catherine Fell, the, uh, the president of the University of Finlay. And I really enjoy listening to her speak rarely. Is there a communication from Dr. Fell that she hasn't masterfully aligned her message with the core beliefs of the university. So this is the um, itinerary for onboarding orientation of new employees at Protec. I retired in May of uh, 2010, and I like to use this example uh, because often I'm asked the question, okay, so you guys use the Baldridge methodology, the Baldridge criteria, you had created a unique call it, uh, culture, uh, was it lasting? And I'm happy to say that um, my successor at Protec uh, used the criteria, uh, maintained the culture that we had established uh, and did it masterfully, much better than I did. But this is the example that I'd like to share with you. For us, orientation was important. There were a number of reasons why, primarily safety, the hazardous work, environment it could be um, and um, safety was a priority so we took two weeks of orientation before we introduced new employees uh, to the facility and uh, this is day one of orientation and uh, our HR director would welcome new employees and then the first person they met was the president of the company and we talked about safety, we talked about our organizational culture, and we talked about our mission, vision, and values. This was so much a part of our process that if, uh, for example, if I had been out of town, if I were in Japan, um, we would delay uh, onboarding new employees on, until I was back so that this was uh, always a part of, of our process. Over communicate purpose. This is um, an example of a, of a Cabelco, Kobe organization uh, in Southern California. Uh, their monthly newsletter, there's always a message from the president, but the panel along the left, col left column always was the mission, values, and vision of the organization. Third theme that we can build process around is trust. Um, and it is trust through leadership. This we borrow from Jim Collins. Um, leaders exhibit humility with an iron will. Jim Collins referred to level five leaders um, in the book, Good to Great. And one of the characteristics of a level five leader was extreme humility and fierce resolve. Uh, never ever mistake kindness for weakness. Simply put, speak the truth. Your team doesn't have to like you. 
but they must trust you. Another theme borrowed from Jim Collins and Good the Great uh, is the example of the window of the mirror. And um, we attempted to practice that a lot in forming a culture, the desired culture that we wanted at ProTech and that the, the folks there uh, felt comfortable in. We actually named our culture at ProTech and we called it Aura. Aura stood for ownership, responsibility, and accountability. The idea of the window in the mirror says that level five leaders uh, deflect praise and credit for success and accept, accept responsibility for problems. So the idea here is that we are always looking through a pane of glass. And when we have success, when things go well, when we have something to celebrate, uh, the credit goes to the team. We could not have accomplished this had it not been for this extraordinary team. Uh, and when something goes wrong, that pane of glass becomes a mirror. And that level five leader, the senior leader, accepts responsibility for a problem and acknowledges that I own this. Um, we failed to prepare you. We failed to train you. We failed to give you the tools you needed to be successful. Um, I believe this is a, a, a very, very important behavior of senior leaders. Um, for those who are basketball fans, I don't happen to be a Michigan State fan, but I'm kind of a Tom Izzo fan and his leadership style. And if you observe him when he speaks to the press about his team, both with wins and losses, he is a master at practicing the window in the mirror. Leaders are approachable. Doors are rarely closed. There are windows in all the doors to offices, conference rooms, and meeting spaces. Um, I think this has become pretty much a standard in all workspaces uh, today, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, Proto Coding Company was established, built in uh, 1991, and we had many, many doors that were solid doors and had no windows in it. And we kept a carpenter very busy for about two months. Uh, putting a window panel in every wooden door at Protec. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but being able to walk past an office or a conference room and say, oh, Al's having a conversation with Jerry. And uh, it's a private conversation that people can see him. Have no reserves parking spots. Get there early and you can park close. If not, the walk will do you good. Um, in fact, um, you may discover some things on that walk. Uh, the walk from the far corner of the park parking lot, more than likely, you'll run into one of your team members. And there is an opportunity to have a conversation, and we might learn something. Um, just as important, uh, this idea or this notion of reserve parking, none of us are that important. Um, and in reality, if there is a need for reserve parking, more than likely there's a larger issue and it is that you have a parking problem. Define clear behavior expectations. Um, I think this is one of my favorites. And this really does become process because it becomes systemic. Be visible, accessible, predictable, accountable, and approachable. Um, I found it easy for me to practice uh, this uh, at Protect Coding Company. We had a single location. It was a large manufacturing facility. And unless I was out of the country in Japan with our Japanese partner, uh, I would be at work uh, a little before six and on the shop floor. Uh, by 6.15, and my behavior was predictable. Uh, I would walk a certain route every day, and healthcare, it would be rounding. And um, when I first decided to do this, I thought, oh, gee, I'm need, going to need to have a topic, an agenda, something to talk about when I run into the associates. And uh, I learned very quickly that we work 12-hour shifts, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
and by 6 a.m. they had been there for 11 hours and there was not a lack of topics for discussion. But it's important to be visible and accessible. We can take a walk and simply by the, our body language and, and uh, the lack of or uh, the abundance of eye contact, we make ourselves visible and accessible. Um, the predictability is that walk and the accountability is um, if someone brings a topic up, um, I get very comfortable saying, hey, if you're looking for an answer or resolution tomorrow, you're gonna be disappointed. If the next time I see you a week from now, uh, I either haven't gotten back to you, there hasn't been a resolution or something hasn't happened, then I should be very disappointed. Define clear behavior expectations and um, we used uh, rules of engagement. Our friends at Mesa uh, created their own rules of engagement and I love it. Um, good strategy, good implementation, uh, good culture has clarity and simplicity and it certainly abounds uh, at Mesa. And I, I think of rules of engagement as operationalizing your values. So we understand our values. Those words describe desirable behaviors within our work culture, but what does that mean on a daily basis? And how can we create um, a few statements, rules of engagement that help us better understand what our values mean to us and how we operationalize them? And here's an example that makes sense. Senior leaders model desired behaviors. I don't think we need to say any more about that. So demonstrate desired behaviors with all stakeholders. And uh, this was a Baldridge learning for me. Uh, it was at one of the conferences where a senior leader from a Baldridge organization really emphasized how important it is that if these are your values, they apply to everyone. Um, typically in business, there is uh, a thought that maybe we schmooze our customers and beat up our suppliers. Um, that doesn't work. Those suppliers are as critical or maybe even more critical to the success of your organization than are your customers. And with that notion and understanding truly who all of our stakeholders are, saying if these are our values, they are our values. Uh, people are watching, our team members are watching, the community is watching, our customers and suppliers are, are watching, and it helps us understand how we should behave. Uh, coach up or coach out, uh, net negatives. Um, I borrowed this from Kendall Stewart, a dear friend who is the chief medical officer uh, at uh, Southern Ohio Medical Center in Portsmouth, Ohio. And um, the understanding of a net negative, a net negative is somebody that we try very hard to change their behavior. Um, they can take uh, the air right out of you, um, whatever, uh, energy and excitement and enthusiasm you have about um, achieving your goals and being the best organization you can be, you struggle when there are net negatives. And typically, uh, it's not easy because a net negative oftentimes is somebody who is very skilled, very, very, very competent. And you ask yourself, oh my gosh, um, they are poisoning a well, they are impacting uh, our organizational culture. And yet I can't do without that person and that skill set. And typically, um, as you try uh, providing expectations but accountability for this teammate, um, three things can happen. And hopefully it's number one, where they say, where has this been all my life? And I really like this structure, this organization, this accountability, and I'm happier in this work environment. Number two, I really like the way I work and my net negative behaviors. And if this organization is going in this direction and I'm gonna be held accountable, more than likely they will self-select out. 
Um, and rarely you come to number three where you have to say, we're gonna part company, but if you do, and when you finally make that decision, uh, it has been my experience that the team will come to them and say, that person was very important to us. They were highly competent and did important work for us, but we have this, um, we've got it covered. And oh, by the way, what took you so long to make this decision? Creating a clear line of sight. Uh, ask yourself um, if you have an embedded core belief, uh, what is most important to your organization? We learned this on our last Baldridge site visit. And on their way out, the examiners, the lead examiner, uh, sometimes will stop and say, you know, I'm not allowed uh, to give you feedback, uh, but, and in this case, it was, I'm not allowed to give you feedback, but we found an embedded core belief. We interviewed all of your employees at ProTech Coding Company and asked them what was most important. And we were amazed to find that each one of them answered, uh, their answer was the same and it came very quickly. And they said, safety. So this might be a good exercise for your organization. Maybe ask your senior leadership team, start there and ask your folks, hey, what is our embedded core belief? Doesn't have to be safety. Um, you know, it, it may be uh, in education, might be the student, uh, it might be the patient, but I, um, I think it will be a good measure of how well you're deploying your core beliefs if, um, if you can ask that question of your organization and, and get a sense of what truly is most important and what's the level of understanding. Create a clear line of sight. This is, this happens to be a local school district that we do some work with. Uh, it's creating a, a plan on a page that allows you on one page to tell your story. Um, clearly uh, articulated mission, uh, values, vision. Here they happen to call values, traits of a black knight. What are your strategic objectives? What are your strategic priorities? And what are your strategic initiatives? But creating a plan on page and using it creatively can become a placemat uh, when you have a meeting. It can be posted in offices and workplaces. Um, more than likely, this is something that is part of your process. But if it isn't, consider it. Uh, include personal goals on each employee's performance review that align very, very closely with mission, vision, and values, and, uh, and emphasize that when you have those opportunities to have one-on-ones with your teammates. Um, create line of sight, begin every monthly meeting with a goal statement review. Um, I'm a big fan of dashboards. Um, as we all know, we could have thousands of data points, thousands of metrics to measure how our organization is doing. I really like the dashboard concept and the metaphor that it is the dashboard in your car, that um, there are maybe a dozen uh, gauges or lights. And um, if you get in your car and they all are green and they all look good, you feel pretty comfortable taking a trip. And if one of them, um, goes red, uh, or you see you're in an area that um, is not under control, it's very easy to go uh, to the auto dealership and plug in the diagnostic device where he can look at thousands of data points. But you've, uh, and you have many, many data points in your organizations, but to take the time, really, really invest the time and determine what are those 10 or 12 high level goals that we'll measure and put on our dashboard? And if it's all green, we know um, we're in a pretty good place. Create line of sight with our customers. I, I really like this. And this was a learning from the client in Southern California. Uh, this is Cabelco compressors and they make very, very large compressors that most of them end up on offshore uh, drilling rigs where a failure could be catastrophic. 
and um, they were having a, a, a difficult time getting a sense of ownership with their teams. And so they began doing this each time a compressor was completed and would ship to the customer. Uh, they would take the team that built that compressor and take a picture of the team with the unit and identifying it by uh, its order number. And they would eventually, they lined the walls of their hallway with these pictures and it created, uh, it achieved what they set out to achieve. There was a, a great sense of ownership with their team and the quality of their work. Visible, accessible, predictable, accountable, and approachable. So I'd like to tell one final story, and I think I have time for that. It's 131. So this is a ProTech story. And we were pretty far along our Baldridge journey when one year at an annual strategic planning event, uh, one of our senior leaders said, you know, um, we think we're pretty special. We have a mission statement that says at ProTech, our mission is to foster human potential in a spirit of cooperation and technical innovation for the betterment of our industry, our associates, and our community. And there is a and we're not living up to our mission. Um, we are not fostering human potential in a significant portion of our community. And she was right. And so we went uh, to the local, the county uh, uh, industry for developmentally challenged adults and asked to bring uh, some of their team into our workforce. And we had four, four or five folks who were helping us um, with basic housekeeping and maintenance in the plant. And we brought a young lady into administrative spaces. Her name was Deanna. And she helped with filing and doing uh, some basic administrative tasks. And um, from the moment we brought Deanna into our workplace, um, she changed us. Uh, she made us better. She improved our culture. Um, each day, Deanna would start her day at my doorstep and come in and say, hey, Paul, how are you doing? And she'd come and give me a big hug. And whether I was having a good day or a bad day, my day got better. And she had the same effect on the rest of our organization. So when I decided to retire and announced my retirement in May of 2010, uh, Deanna thought that that meant she was gonna lose her job. And of course that wasn't the case. And uh, it didn't take too long to convince her she was gonna like the new guy a whole lot better than she liked me. Um, the Thursday night uh, before my final day of Friday, uh, we closed the local restaurant and invited ProTech associates to come through. So um, we could share stories and I could thank them uh, for the great experience that, that I had had uh, working with them and what a privilege it was. Um, and Deanna was there and I got to say hello to her and introduce her to my family. And um, when the evening was over, there were lots of cards and a few gifts and we gathered them up and came home. And uh, I was sitting in the kitchen with my, with my wife opening cards and opening gifts. And it was bittersweet. Um, I was ready to retire after 42 years in the steel industry, uh, but I loved what I did. And uh, so yeah, I was a little, a little emotional. And um, one of the gifts was uh, a gift in a, in a gold cylinder box. And I opened the box and then it was a note. And it was from Deanna. And she said, Paul, thank you for letting me work at ProTech. I know I'm disabled. Down syndrome people, the only ones who love them are their parents. I felt loved at ProTech. Thank you for supporting me in Special Olympics. Go Steelers, and you are a gold medal boss. And in the box, was one of her Special Olympic gold medals. Well, I think you can imagine I was already in a little bit of an emotional state and with that, the tears flowed. But there's a, there's a message there. Um, we used our core beliefs, our mission during our strategic planning um, to make big decisions. 
a decision to build a $600 million steel plant, uh, an addition, that second addition, supported our mission because we had people who had been loyal to Protech, associates taken advantage of our tuition reimbursement program, and many of the things that we wanted folks to do, promising them opportunities for advancement. And we had gone over 10 years without any opportunities and no one left Protech. Um, this uh, was gonna be 98 new jobs and opportunities for people to grow and thrive and for us to promote from within. That supported our mission. But this decision to bring Deanna into our workforce and the effect that it had um, was just as important as that decision to build um, the $600 million addition. So that's about it. And there's Deanna. I think we've saved some time for questions now. I hope it made some sense. Thanks everybody for your patience and listening. Paul, thank you for another great presentation. Uh, I just loved every minute of that. We have got a number of really good questions here. And I'm gonna start off with the uh, first one. Hey, by the way, Paul, uh, I, we just got like seven that said, thank you, what a great story. <laughs> um, but the, the first question we have is uh, from Peggy Pleasant. And she asks, how do you adjust this approach for a hybrid work environment where employee engagement has become especially difficult to measure and maintain? Well, I'm glad you gave me the easy one first, Al. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that's a great, I'm not gonna say that's a great question. It, it, I, I really, it's a very thought provoking question. You know, I still am pretty active working with great organization, uh, doing some coaching. And so my exposure to a hybrid environment uh, because of, certainly because of COVID is fresh. And it wasn't, I, I didn't have to lead an organization working in um, a, uh, a hybrid environment, but I'll just give you my thoughts. I'm a pretty optimistic guy. And I would think that um, if we really, really, believe in creating a culture of excellence um, that that may allow us to even be more productive and more successful when we are working hybrid or when we're working virtual. Um, Okabe refers to a, an abundance mentality uh, or um, a scarcity mentality. And, uh, you know, the old saying, uh, those who say they can and those who say they can't, they're both right. Um, so if really, really being conscious of our core beliefs and uh, allowing that to create expectations for those folks who um, are working from home and working hybrid, um, I'm, 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 you can tell that I'm thinking while I'm trying to answer this question. I think rules of engagement might have great application working in a hybrid environment. Allow the team when they are together uh, to define rules of engagement. How we engage with one another when, uh, especially when it's hybrid. I find doing coaching, that's the environment that is most difficult where there are some people there in person and there um, are some virtual. That's really, really challenging. A rule of engagement might be helpful in a situation like that. I guess, I don't know if it's a good answer, but I think that would be my answer. Okay, Paul, thank you. Uh, our next one comes from Angela and she asks, I am interested in any suggestions that you can give to employers with multiple work locations. Yeah. Um... However, wherever the opportunities are to get folks from those multiple organizations together, even if it's infrequently, to be a part of creating your core beliefs, um, 
I think is important. I think using your imagination, taking the idea of uh, predictable, visible, approachable, accessible, accountable. Um, and I think it would be a lot of work for the senior leader, but I can't imagine anything that would be more important and, and being accessible um, and, and finding ways uh, to communicate to the entire group that while we are different in different locations and have different tasks, at our core, we are the same. Easy to say, not that easy to do. Our next question is in pursuit of excellence sustainable for a long period, is the pursuit of excellence sustainable for a long period of time? And what explains some excellent companies like maybe GE going downhill after the performance excellence plateau? Part of why I was so interested in the Baldridge criteria and what it could do for us was I saw the, the, the distinctly different cultures. I spent my first 26 years uh, working for US Steel and integrated steel plants, and then came to a very, very flat organization by design located in the middle of a cornfield where no one had ever, ever seen a steel mill before. And the striking difference in the cultures um, were dramatic. And I believe it contributed to the success at Protec. And for me, um, I, I was so, they, they didn't know how special it was uh, to be a ProTech associate and be part of that organization, be part of that community. And for me, I didn't ever want it to be, you know, a Jack Welsh kind of thing or a Lee Iacocca kind of thing. I, I loved that place and those associates. And for me, it was more important to create something that um, the day after I left, it would be uh, Paul Who. We have systems and processes and uh, and a culture that identifies how we behave and how we do our work. And um, so, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I support, uh, I, I would never ever uh, think of myself as a level five leader, but it's something to aspire to be. And there's great, uh, I'm sure everybody's read to so great, but to go back and revisit it and read the chapter on leadership and the qualities of level five leadership. I think leaders um, help make that transition so that it's not an organization of heroes. Um, it's, uh, it's a team. Our next question is, where does a new leader start when moving into an organization needing serious cultural transformation? Uh, Visible, approachable, accessible, uh, predictable, and accountable, um, and uh, and listen, 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 listen. Avoid saying this is how I did it um, in the place that I came from. Uh, establishing trust, um, establishing uh, uh, being predictable, so that. When you do get around to implementing change, it's not uh, the flavor of the day. Um, the notion of kindness is not weakness is really, really powerful. Being able to control your emotions and control your temper when you get extremely frustrated about that cultural that that culture that needs to be transformed um, is a good place to start. Uh, anecdotally, there was just a few years ago, I was serving on the local YMCA board, and um, 
I got a message very late one evening, said we have an immediate need for an interim CEO. And we looked at the job description and it said, very, very old steel guy. And we only know one. Um, so uh, I agreed to, to do it uh, on a temporary basis. And, um, and the challenge is there uh, were cultural. And it's unfortunate because anybody who's ever been around a while or not any not-for-profit knows that uh, people are overworked and underpaid. And yet it, was a, it wasn't a very healthy culture. And finally, one day, I, we weren't making any progress. People were, I don't know whether they didn't trust or afraid, whatever. And I just went to the whiteboard and just wrote four words and said, be excellent, be kind, and now go to work. And um, it started popping up everywhere. It certainly wasn't planned. I wish I could say I was that clever. It wasn't. It was more a source of frustration. And that saying started popping up everywhere and we changed. Our next question comes from Paul. And after emphasizing what a great presentation this was, he's asking, how was your performance excellence journey viewed by your Japanese and US co-owners? And did they see you as role models to emulate? I believe I believe the U.S. Steel folks um, appreciated what we did. They appreciated the results, certainly. There were no efforts to replicate, though, what we were doing at Protec. Um, and our, our Japanese leaders um, accepted it quickly. It aligned much more closely with their approach to work. Um, at least the systematic approach, the process, 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 uh, part of Baldridge uh, aligned more closely with uh, our, our Kobe uh, leaders. And as a follow-up to that, what would be your advice to other manufacturing organizations, i.e. starting a performance excellence initiative? There's never the perfect time. Uh, if you're waiting for the perfect time, you'll never start. Um, uh, you can kick the tires for years and all it does is leave you with tires that have hundred percent tread and sidewalls are shut. Um, so my advice is start um, because for every, it, 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 and it's, it's a long journey. Um, you don't one day, say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do Baldridge and next year we're gonna go to Washington and receive an award. Um, actually, by the time you get around to being lucky, and there's a lot of luck, lucky enough to be accepting that piece of crystal, it's not about the trophy anymore, it's about the Ophi. Okay, our next question comes from Dale and it's uh, somewhat similar. Uh, why would you say more organizations have not adopted Baldridge as its framework? Uh, the data shows that there's less than 10% of organizations globally that actually use such a framework after 30 plus years. And why is it that um, what we can do, and what is it that we can do to accelerate the adoption on a much broader scale in all organizations? Um, I think it's it's hard work and at the end of it, looking back, saying the journey was certainly worth it, but I believe uh, all of us involved who care about Baldridge um, could find ways uh, to not make it easier because the results come from the rigor, but um, creating pathways, creating opportunities for people to begin the journey and see the benefit uh, in, uh, yeah. And I, I, I'm trying not to say easy. Um, clarity and simplicity. Clarity and simplicity works. Um, 
in everything. And if we could keep the rigor, but create clarity and simplicity so that it is truly uh, a more welcoming and less frightening uh, consideration, um, I, think, I think that might help. We have an obligation. Um, rather than saying, this is really, really tough and, uh, and we battled it and looked look at the success we had. Uh, I think we have an obligation to help others get there with more clarity and simplicity, not easier. We've got time for one more question, and this one looks like it's going to involve some storytelling, Paul, which is uh, your expertise. Can you share a situation when the business was seriously impacted by negative external forces, and how did you sustain your culture to get through it? So um, the economic downturn in 2007, 2008, um, well, I know exactly when it was. It was September 2008 because that was the September after we uh, were in Washington in April to receive uh, the 2007 Baldrige Award. And we were operating at Oh, about 120% of capacity. Um, the business was growing rapidly. We were developing new products. Our safety performance was remarkable, extremely profitable. Profit sharing distributions for the two previous years were between 38 and 42%, and we were fine. And then the bottom fell out of the economy and it was near collapse of the automotive industry. And uh, we didn't know what to do. Um, there had never ever been a layoff at ProTech. Uh, we could barely operate one line, uh, one shift a day. And, uh, and we decided uh, to practice Baldridge and uh, um, really relied on our team, appealed to our team and said, um, I can remember the day like it was yesterday. And I stood in front of the of the, of the organization and said, hey, look, um, we are all, management's gonna take a 20% pay cut. Um, we're gonna cut hours of our operating teams by, uh, by 20%. There will be no layoffs. We don't have a process. We have a process for everything, but we don't have one for layoffs. Um, and uh, we're gonna shed all of our, um, support from the outside um, and we're gonna go to work. You guys uh, that were operating, uh, the coding lines may become a security guard or a janitor, but we're gonna get through this. And short of closing the doors and turning out the lights and heading down road five for the last time, we're gonna make it, uh, now go to work. And fortunately, everybody in the room believed what I said, the only person who didn't was me. And that was okay. Uh, and we survived. Um, and they came up with great ideas. Uh, we managed to keep our customers have remarkable safety performance, remain profitable. And uh, a year later, when the economy came back and the auto industry came back, um, we were thriving. Well, thanks again, Paul. Outstanding presentation. Uh, loved all the answers to the questions. And for those questions that we did not get to, as a reminder to the audience, uh, we're going to get those questions to Paul, and Paul will get back with you individually. As a reminder to everybody out there, the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence has numerous courses available online at your own pace. And we are currently showcasing uh, two, one in supply chain management, and then our boot camp coming up this fall for uh, strategy in healthcare. And that's a certification program conducted over 10 days along with the George Washington University and LBL Strategies. Once again, thanks to all of our sponsors out there, and especially those members of the Mac Balder Society who make up the trustees of the Institute for Performance Excellence. Uh, it's thanks to their generous support that programs like today are available to the general public. 
Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in today. Paul, thanks again for such a great presentation, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care.